Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, Juneteenth evening prayer service, um, Joan service between um, St. Luke's and... We are not live yet. It's oh. just a second. I'll give you a cue, okay? Oh, great. So I, I just wanted to say, everyone, um, we I'll, I'll start to welcome and then introduce the hymn. Give me a cube, Kyle, when you're ready. And so um, Barbara Hedberg has not joined us. She apparently has access issues. Um, Bob is going to read her portion. Well, okay. dormant. Yeah. We are ready in three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Juneteenth evening prayer service, um, joint service offered by St. Luke's and Trinity on the Green here in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, many people are joining us tonight. We give each other an extra minute to make sure we can join the service. Um, there were some access challenges tonight, and so in about 30 seconds, we'll go ahead um, but join us in prayer already on this very significant day. Um, Juneteenth 2020 is a very ju different Juneteenth than um, at other years. Um, so much has happened this year. Um, so I'm so glad we can join each other in prayer. Um, thank you for, for being here. So we're going to start the service. Welcome to this special Juneteenth celebration, celebration of freedom and end of slavery. On this June 19th, 2020, in the year of 2020 vision, where many things, especially the cause of African Americans, are receiving new perspective. Tonight we gather to celebrate Juneteenth together, the oldest nationwide holiday celebration to end slavery. And like the memorial of the Exodus liberation one time when the children asked the question, how is this night different than other nights? African-Americans ponder their own questions, questions that we'll hear tonight. One given us by William Edward Berger Du Bois, du Bois um, challenging us when he's asking, between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question. How does it feel to be a problem? And he continues to say, it's a question that makes your blood boil. So tonight, we ask these questions again, but they resonate in a different way. Since George Floyd slaughtering like a sacrificial lamb, the whole nation, even the whole international community, is now slowly becoming a bit more woke. A groundswell movement for justice and change is now pouring into our American streets with the simple but loud demand, stop the carnage. Tonight's gathering is very symbolic for our own parishes, St. Luke's and Trinity, New Haven, because we have joined to celebrate this Juneteenth service um, with a preparation that started long ago before these events with the intention to engage in racial reconciliation. Because in 1842, an opposite dynamic split us apart. In that year, Trinity's vestry relegated the African-American church members to four pews in the rear of the gallery in the church and showed plainly that they no longer wanted black folk as fellow Christians. Alexander Du Bois, the great grandfather of W.E.B. Du Bois, led the revolt and brought the outrage and the indignant black members of Trinity to their independent church, St. Luke's Parish. Tonight's 21st century Juneteenth is a different milestone when we come together and we gather together and we see each other as sisters and brothers and we come intentionally with the hope to celebrate this liberation as a way to build reparation, to restore dignity and to engage in racial reconciliation. So it is an honor for me to introduce this celebration and to be here and to 
stand shoulder to shoulder, I'll buy it virtually together with our sisters and brothers in faith, African American, African American members of our community. And we hope that we continue this reconciliation um, from here on onward. This is why I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude that the community of St. Luke's is so gracious and courageous to welcome our Trinity community into a joint journey of racial reconciliation. In thanksgiving to everyone who worked very hard tonight, I give a special thanks to Valerie Stanley, Lisa Yarber, George de Jong, our special preacher tonight, friend and colleague, the Reverend Rowena Kemp, not so long ago, Associate Rector at Trinity, the Reverend Tom Jackson, Rector at St. Luke's, everyone who worked hard on the music part, Arjit Chakriborty, Deborah Thiessen, Walden Moore, Kyle Pika, and then also Lucille Bruce and the Reverend Kyle Peterson, deacon at Trinity and in many new, at many New Haven churches, and also the Reverend Heidi Thorson, deacon at Trinity. So let us now start our Juneteenth celebration, mindful of the size of generation that brought us here tonight and happily together now towards a path of reconciliation and renewal, united in church as sisters and brothers of the same God, Lord, and Savior. And so now we will start with the opening hymn um, from the Heritage Chorale, the Reflection Hymn, I Have Been Buked, followed by the Justice Hymn from Lift Every Voice and Sing, also sung by the Heritage Chorale. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So yes, uh, we will continue right away with um, Standing for Justice and from Lift Every Voice and Sing. Um, please stand as you're able and join in singing with the members of um, the Heritage Chorale of New Haven this time again.
light and peace in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp to put it under a bucket, but on a lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. And you, like the lamp, must shed light among your fellow men so that they may see the good you do and give glory to your Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for surrounding us as daylight fades with the brightness of the Vesper light. And we implore you of your great mercy that as you unfold us, enfold us with your radiance of this light, so you would shine into our hearts the brightness of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God, you make my darkness bright. You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God, you make my darkness bright. You have been my helper. My God, you make my darkness bright. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. You, O Lord, are my lamp. My God, you make my darkness bright. The sun knows the time of its setting. You make darkness, but it might be night. Almighty God, open our ears, hearts, and minds to receive what you have to teach us tonight. Speak to us now as you spoke to those who walked with you before us. Tell us again the stories of your wonders and greatness. We are ready to hear them. Remind us of your grace and steadfast love. We are ready to live by them Shine your light into our hearts and minds so we may find our way to justice, freedom, and peace. Amen.
Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven. O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed. Now as we come in the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices. O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. The words to this poem are by Polly Murray. We are spendthrifts with words. We squander them, toss them like pennies in the air, arrogant words, angry words, cruel words, comradely words, shy words, tiptoeing from mouth to ear. But the slowly wrought words of love and the thunderous words of heartbreak, those we hoard. A reading, a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim victory to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our, of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from the souls of black folks. Between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half-hesitant sort of way, eye me curiously or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, or do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile, or am interested, or reduce the boiling to a simmer as the question as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer, seldom a word. And yet being a problem is a strange experience peculiar even for one who has never been anything else, save perhaps in babyhood and in Europe. It is in the early days of rollicking boyhood that the revelation first bursts upon me, all in a day, as it were. I remember well when the shadows swept across me. I was a little thing, away up in the hills of New England, where the dark Housatonic lines between the Hoosac and Dagonic to the sea, in a wee wooden schoolhouse, Something put it into the boys' and girls' heads to buy gorgeous visiting cards, 10 cents a package, and exchange. The exchange was merry, till one girl, a tall newcomer, refused my card. Refuse it peremptorily, with a glance. Then it dawned upon me with a certain sadness that I was different from the others, or like my half, in heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil. I had thereafter no desire to tear down that veil, to creep through. I held all beyond it in common contempt, 
and lived above it in a region of blue sky and great wandering shadows. That sky was bluest when I could beat my teammates at examination time, or beat them at a foot race, or even beat their stringy heads. Alas, with the years, all this fine contempt began to fade. For the words I longed for, and all their dazzling opportunities were theirs, not mine. But they should not keep their prizes, I said. Some, all I would wrest from them. Just how I would do it, I could never decide. By reading law, by healing the sick, with telling the wonderful tales that swung in my head, some way. With other black boys, the strife was not so fiercely sunny. Their youth shrunk into tasteless sycophancy or into silent hatred of the pale word about them and mocking distrust of everything white or wasted itself in a bitter cry. Why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in my own house? Gospel according to Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, 
and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From On Imagination by Phyllis Wheatley. Imagination, who can sing thy force? Or who describe the swiftness of thy course? Soaring through air to find the bright abode, the embryo palace of the thundering God. We on thy pinions can surpass the wind and leave the rolling universe behind. From star to star, the mental optics rove, measure the skies and range the realms above. There is one view we grasp, the mighty whole, or with new worlds amaze the unbounded soul. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brothers and sisters, tonight I have a few questions for you. What are you willing to do for the sake of the gospel? Who are you willing to be or become for the sake of the gospel? And what risk are you willing to take to follow Jesus Christ? There is nothing new, extraordinary, or even attractive about these questions. Christians have for centuries wrestled with the tension inherent in them by the lives they have lived, and the harsh choices they have had to make against incredible odds. So brothers and sisters, what are you willing to do for the sake of the gospel? A gospel that calls us to stand up for the marginalized, the oppressed, the poor, the immigrant, the stranger, the homeless, the hungry, the LGBTQ community, the aged, the black and brown bodies in our midst. What are you willing to do for the sake of the gospel? Tonight, we gather as the people of God to celebrate the delayed liberation and freedom promised by the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, delayed. History tells us that the word didn't reach the folks in Texas because one, the Union soldier chosen to bring the message was murdered before he could deliver it. Or two, the enslavers wanted another harvest with free labor. Or three, federal troops actually waited for the enslavers to reap the benefits of the last cotton harvest before enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation. 
So tonight, we celebrate this delayed liberation. And I wonder if we're not still stuck as people of color, stuck in the chains of mental slavery, stuck in chains that still redline our communities, stuck in chains that result in lower funding of our black children's schools and our communities, stuck in chains that limit the type and quality of healthcare we receive, stuck in chains that determine what jobs we get, even though as people of color, many of us are oftentimes two or three times more qualified than the people who supervise us. Brothers and sisters, we're still stuck in chains that cost us more to own our homes. Stuck in chains that suggest, as people of color, to know our place. Brothers and sisters, I've come to tell you tonight, it is time for our liberation to come. I know for me, the events of the past few weeks with the killings of Brianna, Ahmad, George, and Richard, my liberation had to come because I have to do something it is time for all our liberation to come. It was never given because we all know slavery did not end. It just transformed, transitioned. It took on a new face, a new cloak, a new mask. From societal segregation to Jim Crow laws, to the new Jim Crow of the prison pipeline and living while black. Brothers and sisters, we must be the generation that steps up and steps out to take our freedom and liberate our people. We must wrest it from those who say all lives matter, all lives will only matter when black lives have equal importance, equal value, equal dignity, and equal worth. White brothers and sisters, we need you. I need you. I want you to know that I'm tired of being treated as a fraction of a person. I'm tired of having to work twice or three times as hard to do the same job, only to receive municipal recognition, if any at all. I'm tired of well-meaning white people who won't do the work of racial healing, who won't do the work of racial justice, and who won't do the work of racial reconciliation, because it was done 50 years ago. And white brothers and sisters, I know. I know it's hard work. You don't know where to start. You don't want to offend anyone. But by God, do something. Please do something. And white brothers and sisters, stop saying you're woke. Saying it doesn't make it so. Reading one book or being in a book group doesn't make it so. Nor does having one black friend or hiring a few people of color, it doesn't make it so when these same people you tote around because of your woke hiring practices are treated and paid unequally in the workplace. 
You are woke when you open your heart and your mind and see the image of God in black and brown bodies. You are woke when your interaction with us is no different than your interaction with your white family, your white colleagues, and your white friends. You are woke when you use your white privilege to dismantle white supremacy and to eradicate unjust legislation that sends a poor black mother to prison for six years for falsely registering her child in a better school district than the one in her black community. And then you turn around and you give a white mother a small farm and two months in prison for cheating the system for her child to get into an Ivy League school. Brothers and sisters, if you are woke, why are you still standing idly by as black and brown bodies are denied the right to life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Over the last few weeks, many have taken to the streets in protest against police brutality and police violence, despite COVID-19 concerns. Because it was that important to show our solidarity, to voice our united concerns and anger that enough is enough. We're tired of being murdered. We're tired of crying for another mother's unarmed child. We're tired of senselessly losing another mother's child because someone felt the skin we're in was threatening. Stop telling us how we should feel. We're tired of being tired. Black lives matter. Black lives la matter. At home, I have two beautiful black boys, both toddlers. They're happy, they're curious, they're playful, they're protected, and they know that they are loved abundantly unconditionally and fully. Whenever we're out and about, people of all walks of life, races and ethnicities stop us to play peekaboo with them or to admire the way they're dressed or to say how beautiful they are. And yes, if I may say so myself, they are beautifully handsome black boys. And I think to myself, a day will come when these same people will look at them as threatening, as less than, as aggressors to be made examples of, or as threats to quash and eliminate. And my heart breaks. And I think of the blessed Mother of God, Mary, most holy. How she pondered the words the angel spoke to her and the message he brought. The quickening in her womb that was literally a divine experience. And even the miracle of his cousin John. I think of how she comp contemplated the shepherds, lowly and smelly and rough around the edges, who came and knelt before the baby who had been kicking inside her womb, even though she'd been a virgin. She pondered the trek to Jerusalem and the ancient prophecies. And I can only imagine how proud she felt when her son, when he returned home and preached in the synagogue, and how she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart often. 
and frequently. And brothers and sisters, here he is tonight in our text, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. One colleague noted in his blog that in Luke's account of the gospel, what Jesus reads and says today are his first recorded public words. And he speaks them in the town in which he grew up, in the synagogue where he worshiped as a child, among the people who know him and his family. It's almost as if he is saying, I'm back and let me tell you who I am and what I, I am about. Jesus is naming what God is concerned about in this world. He's naming a truth and a responsibility for bringing that truth into existence. He's describing the work and direction of his life. He's taking a stand, a very public stand. And brothers and sisters, this frightens and terrifies me. And yet, this is the work of racial healing, justice, and reconciliation. It is the work of dismantling white supremacy and the sin of racism. We're all called to do in our world. How blessed we are tonight that St. Luke's and Trinity on the Green have taken this work of racial healing, justice, and reconciliation to heart. For over a year and a half, they have been privately walking together. They have been researching their stories, their truths, and they have been building relationship, learning to trust one another as brothers and sisters, beloved and created in the image of Almighty God. They have modeled and emulated how what is possible when both parties, members of a white congregation and members of a black congregation that walked out come together. And brothers and sisters, the work continues. Each community has far to go before others can sit at their table. And oh, what a table. What a table that is. It is itself the kingdom of God come near. I invite you to keep them in your prayers as they continue to join you together and relive hard truths, missed opportunities, and following Jesus in a city big enough for both of their ministries. Brothers and sisters, St. Luke's and Trinity on the Green have shown us how, if we're willing, we can stand for the gospel. So, how far are we willing to go for this gospel we claim to love and follow? How will we make it so that my little boys will be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin? How will you and I ensure that I don't have to have the talk with my boys? 
How will you ensure that our churches will become communities that live the gospel by our love and action rather than our ability to be monuments to a time past and a, and a colonial empire no longer present? Brothers and sisters, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Are you willing to stand for the gospel you preach? Amen. Dear sisters and brothers of African descent, as we begin this affirmation of Juneteenth, we must acknowledge that some of the joyful thanksgiving that was felt by our ancestors just does not resonate with us today. We must acknowledge we as a people continue to suffer and we as a people still need to be healed. As we commemorate freedom as African Americans, let us not forget the trials and tribulations faced by our ancestors forced into slavery for hundreds of years. We have come far and survived immense assaults, but these remain trying times largely because of the lie of black inferiority. Let us continue to emphasize the importance of education and the advancement of the African-American race. We pray for God's guidance as we seek ways not just to overcome, but also to overturn the lie of black inferiority. God has granted us freedom. Let us use it wisely, guard it carefully, and enhance it totally. Essential to this process is first, a reckoning with the forces of history through the work of emotional emancipation. Let all people of all religions come together and acknowledge a period in our history that shaped and continues to negatively influence American society. As we gather today with our sisters and brothers whose ancestors were our oppressors, let us pray not only for our own healing, but for theirs as well. Allow other ethnic groups to be sensitized to the conditions of our ancestors that they endured and help them to understand why racism and bigotry cannot have the last word. Let us pray with our sisters and brothers as they walk on their journey of self-awareness. Let all African Americans continue to hope for a better tomorrow while remembering and rejoicing over our triumphant heritage. Emotional emancipation requires healing the historical trauma of 250 years of enslavement. We will not forget the Middle Passage. We will continue to tell our ancestral story of bondage that gave way to freedom, both physically and spiritually we shall forever strive to advance the kingdom of God through liberation and excellence. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The collect of the day. Oh. oh my God. The fountain of all wisdom. You know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance 
in asking have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things for which our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask through the worthiness of your son Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen and collect for the presence of Christ Lord Jesus Stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our companion in the way, kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you as you are revealed in scripture and the breaking of bread. Grant this for the sake of your love. Amen. Almighty God, who gave to your servant Cyprian boldness to confess the name of our Savior Jesus Christ before the rulers of this world, and courage to die for this faith. Grant that we may always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us, and to suffer gladly for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend to the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time together, for this opportunity to have your word broken open to us in such powerful form, and for the opportunity to work together and find ways to make Black Lives Matter 
in this city and across America and around this world. A prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time and with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.